Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this OU STEM British Science Week event. Um, the OU STEM science faculty is made up of four schools and the Knowledge Media Institute. And today's session is brought to you by the School of Mathematics and Statistics. Today we have senior lecturer in applied mathematics, Mark Pradas, and PhD student, Alex Rand, giving you a session on chaos theory and the butterfly effect. So without further ado, I will hand over to Mark. Thank you, Charlotte, and welcome everyone to this session on chaos theory. My name is Mark Pradas, and I'm a senior lecturer in applied mathematics at the Open University, where I teach several subjects in mathematics and as well as do research on dynamical systems and fluid mechanics. And today I'm also joined by uh, Alex Round. Yes, hi, I'm Alex. I'm a third year PhD student at the Open University working with Mark. Uh, my research involves work with falling liquid films. Okay, so let's just start. Let me share the screen. Okay, hopefully everyone can see this. So in this session, we will be exploring the concept of chaos and we'll be looking at the mathematics behind this concept. There will be some activities that will be available through the website Desmos which you can access by clicking at the link that is provided in the chat, or just go to student.desmos.com and enter this code uh, given in this first slide. We will repeat the code later on in the session. But before we start, we would like to ask you one simple question. So what do you think is chaos? What is the first thing that comes into your mind when uh, we say the word chaos? Do you have an idea of what it means mathematically. I think this is a word that we use commonly in our everyday experiences, but we would like you to ask you what is the first thing, or if you have an idea what chaos means, please try to uh, just write down any suggestion, any comment in the chat of what do you think is chaos? We start seeing some answers in the chat, randomness. That's one way of thinking about it. Any other suggestion? Yeah, messy is something else. So, disorganized, anything you cannot predict or fully control. Yeah, all of these are good suggestions. It's, it's a good indication that what's happening within the mathematics. So, but word, uh, the word chaos is actually something that is very common in our vocabulary. And normally in, normal, in everyday situations, we think about chaos as something that is in complete disorder and in confusion. And uh, normally the word chaos makes it to the news headlines whenever we try to explain or describe situations like this. We say that there are chaotic scenes at train stations, at airports, or on the roads. And you see that this is the idea of being in disorder and confusion, and that basically we don't know what's going to happen. So that's the idea of chaos when we try to use it in our everyday experiences. But in mathematics, the concept of chaos is a slightly similar to this, but fundamentally very different. And when we talk about chaos in, within mathematics, what we refer to is a very specific type of motion, a type of movement. And we say that chaotic system is very erratic, which means that it's irregular, it has a very irregular motion, and also is seemingly very unpredictable. This is one way of describing chaos within mathematics. Another way would be that chaos is the ability of simple models to generate highly complex behavior. And this is a very important message and we, which we will be exploring in this session. This idea that we have a very simple mathematical method model, which is basically some mathematical rules, which are very simple, and yet they are able to produce highly complicated behavior. So we will see several examples of this in this session. But perhaps the best way to illustrate what is chaos is to, is to show you a simple example. So let's just start by showing you something that is not chaos. 
And this is going to be through this very simple mechanical system, which is uh, known as a single pendulum. And it's uh, basically a single bar that is attached to a fixed point here, and then it can move around this point in the middle. So if I lift this uh, bar and then let it go, hopefully without surprises, what you will expect to happen is that basically the bar moves left and right, left and right. I'm playing this movie in a slow motion, so hopefully you can see this uh, clearly in your computer or on your iPad. So this is an example of a regular periodic motion. It's very easy to predict because if it's on the left, we know that it's gonna go to the right and so on and so on. So this is not chaos. But even though this is a very simple type of motion, this motion is something that we observe in many different uh, daily life experiences. For example, this is something, the ticking noise of a, of, a, of a clock, the motion of a swing, of a rocking chair, all of these are examples of periodic regular motion that are repeating over time. So this is not chaos, and these are very, uh, let's say simple type of motion that is very regular. So let's now complicate things a little bit more. And let's go, go back to this mechanical system. And now instead of looking at a single pendulum, we'll be looking at the motion of a double pendulum, which means now we have a, another bar attached at the end of the first bar. And this yellow bar can move around the end of the black bar. So now I'm gonna do the same. So I'm gonna lift this object and I'm gonna let it go. And I'm gonna play it in a slow motion again. So while you watch this movie, I would like to, to for you to think whether you would be able to predict uh, what's the motion of the yellow bar is going to be. So can, by looking at the motion of the movie, can you say where it's going to go? So let me show what happens. So we can see that the black bar more or less goes left to right, left to right, but the yellow bar is following a rather irregular and unpredictable motion. Sometimes it spins to the left, sometimes it spins to the right, it does it twice, like now, even three times. Now it goes to the left and doesn't really spin, keeps continuing. Well, now it's keep spinning to the right, but then sometimes it goes to the left and so on. So if you were to try to predict what's going to happen by just looking at it, it would be very difficult to say what's going to happen. Eventually, the motion slows down because of friction with the air and to the mechanical system. But the idea is that this rather simple mechanical device is able to produce a rather complicated and irregular motion. So this is an example of irregular motion, which again is observed in many daily life experiences. For example, the falling leaf uh, is rather irregular. The motion of billion boats hitting uh, with each other, again, is something that is quite difficult to predict. And also at larger length scales, you could think of the motion of the atmosphere is rather uh, irregular and unpredictable. And also within the realm of fluid mechanics, there's plenty of examples that exhibit irregular motion, such as water coming out of a tap. So when we talk about chaos, uh, we're thinking about two important qualities or properties. The first one is that chaotic systems exhibit this irregular and erratic motion. But perhaps the most important property of, of a chaotic system is that chaotic motion, it's also very sensitive to the initial conditions. And to illustrate this phenomenon, let me show you this by looking again at this mechanical system of double pendulum. But now instead of looking at one double pendulum, we'll be looking at two double pendulum, one in front of the other. And what we're gonna do, basically what I'm gonna try to here is to lift the two double pendulums and locate them more or less at the same height and then I'm gonna to try to release them at the same time. So let's see what happens. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna play this in a slow motion. So we can see that initially, both a double pendulum were following the same oscillations, but after two or three seconds, then they started to oscillate completely different. And, and now, as you can see that, the pendulum in the front oscillates to the right while the other one goes to the left. And so, so now they are following completely different uh, trajectories, what we would say. 
So this is an illustration of this phenomenon of being sensitive to the initial conditions. And here, this is a real experiment. And you could think that if I could start these two double pendulum exactly from the same location and release them from the same time exactly, then what you would observe is that they follow the same oscillations for a long time. But of course, I try to do this with my hand, which is not very accurate. And actually, if I repeat this experiment again, now I'm going to show you another experiment played next to the original one, we will see that the oscillations again become very different. So the one on the left, after two, three seconds, they start to deviate. And the one on the right, you can see that they're still going uh, in sync, but then eventually they separate and give rise to completely different oscillations. So this is an illustration of something known as being very or having a sensitive dependence on the initial conditions. So this is a real experiment, uh, which of course, uh, I cannot really have much control about what I'm doing with my hand here. So you might wonder how can we test this idea of sensitive dependence on initial conditions even further in a more controlled setting. So to illustrate this, now uh, Alex is going to show you a computational animation of this problem with a mathematical model. So here we see a numerically simulated double pendulum, or we will see. Um, so this blue state is what I'm going to call the original steady state. And then below, when it appears, you'll see 10 colors. And this is the exact same simulation, but it is performed with the initial angle at a slightly different value, only a very small, slightly different value. And if you do this numerically, it allows you to do these very small changes, but it also means it's accurate rather than trying to perform it physically, like Mark said. And sensitive dependence on initial conditions is where this little change in the uh, initial angle will cause a massive change in the behavior after a period of time. So we observe here that there is no change. We, they are staying together. But after a certain period of time, they'll start to diverge from each other. And this is a massive change in the dynamics. And this definitely shows the sensitive dependence on initial conditions because we've only changed the angle very, very slightly. But as you can see here, each one is doing its own thing. Okay, thank you, Alex. Yeah, so that's the idea of being very sensitive to initial conditions, and we will explore this with simple mathematical methods. At this point, we would like, is, is there any question, anything that is not clear so far? Any comment? Well, seems oh. everything clear. Yeah. I was just going to ask a question while we're waiting for the um, uh, participants to ask a question. So, in your two, in your experiment, you had your two double pendulums. Are they um, completely independent, or does one is one affected by the other? Yeah. So, in principle, we tried when we design this uh, this device, we try to design it in such a way that they are fully independent or as much as possible. But of course, they are mechanically connected so in, up to some extent. So we would expect that there is some slight correlation between them. But even though there might be some slight correlation, we believe that that's not uh, sufficiently strong in order that one influences the motion of the other. And actually, we try to uh, play to basically play with them independently. And we indeed observe that we cannot consider them to be fully independent for the purposes of the illustration of this phenomenon of chaotic motion and these sensitive dependent on initial conditions. So yeah, I think we can be say safely that they are fully independent, but obviously in practice, there's gonna be always some sort of correlation between them, which is sufficiently small, we can say. Okay, if there is no more comments or more questions, perhaps we can continue. So, Chaos theory is, the, uh, is a branch of mathematics that normally is studied within mathematics and physics. And the idea what we're going to do here is to explore the mathematics behind this. So the a branch of mathematics that covers uh, chaos theory is known as dynamical systems, which are mathematical models to study changes in time. So generally, this will be studied 
by making use of what is known as differential equations, which is something that goes beyond the scope of this session because requires the knowledge of some advanced mathematical concepts. But instead of looking at differential equations, here we'll be looking at try to model uh, things that change in time by looking at sequences of numbers. And we'll be looking at a very important and famous equation known as the logistic map. We'll ex explore the idea that these dynamical systems are in fact deterministic, which means that they are predictable. But because they are very sensitive to the initial conditions when, when we are dealing with chaotic systems, we will see that this leads to the concept of the butterfly effect, which basically challenges this idea of being deterministic. So we will explore the consequences of this uh, phenomenon of sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And at the end, if there is some time, we will also explore the connection between uh, chaos and these beautiful objects known as fractals. So the aim of this session is to show you what's the connection between a fish population, a butterfly, and these objects known as fractals, and how all of these are related to this very simple mathematical equation known as the logistic map. So let's start by uh, building the foundations of the mathematical modeling of things that change in time. And to do this, let's revisit the problem of a, of a single pendulum. So let's assume that we have a single pendulum and we measure the angle with respect to the vertical. And uh, let's say that the, the pendulum can move between left and right. And now we would like to ask you to do a simple activity, basically by looking at this motion, Can you tell me, uh, or can you sketch the time evolution of the angle versus time? If you go to Desmos, you, can, you will find a, uh, the first activity which show you this axis, and you can sketch the time evolution of this angle. Or if you prefer, you could, if, you, if you can type in the chat a mathematical function that you think can describe this time evolution of the single pendulum. Just to show you how Desmos Look, you will have this activity here, and by using this uh, tool of a sketching, you can basically sketch whatever you want. So, what we would like you to do here is basically to sketch the evolution of this angle versus time, or type a mathematical function that describes this in the chat if you think you can think of a mathematical function describing the evolution of this. We see some answers at the chat, sign, yeah. Yeah, we start to see some, sorry. I think we have some answers in Desmos, but I think they, they are in the right direction. Yeah, just to show you some of the... some of the answers that have been given. You can see that more or less all of them agree showing this sinusoidal evolution in time. I think... So yeah, that's indeed the evolution of the angle. It's you can represent it in terms of a cosine or a sine function. It's a sinusoidal evolution that repeats over time. And that's a way of quantifying this continuously in time. So it goes from ref, right to left continuously. And this means that basically we are measuring the angle continuously as time changes. And mathematically, this can be fully quantified in terms of a cosine or a sine function. However, this, there is another alternative way of quantifying this motion. If instead of looking at this continuously in time, we could measure uh, the evolution of the angle at some specific point in time. And let's say that we measure the angle when it's on the left or on the right. And now uh, let's say that we take these measurements equally spaced in time. So if we remove this continuous dependence, the, the red line, you can see we are given with a sequence of points, which we can represent in terms of a sequence of numbers, which is one minus one, one minus one, and so on. 
And the idea is that even though we have removed pretty much a lot of information from the continuous uh, motion, this discretized sequence of numbers is actually enough to tell us that the motion behind this object is periodic because this is represented in terms of a sequence where there are two numbers that are repeating over and over. So this of course is a very simple example of motion. It's periodic motion. And we could repeat the same with a double pendulum. We, we are not gonna ask to sketch this because this could become a little bit more uh, tricky to do this. You can see that now the angle oscillates, sometimes it goes all the way up to the left, sometimes all the way to the right, sometimes oscillates in the middle. So the sketching this evolution now will be much, much more complicated. And I'm just gonna show you the actual time, uh, time evolution of this angle. So you can see that now it's very irregular in time. It's not repeating in time. And this again is the time that uh, continuous time evolution of the angle. But again, we could measure this at different points equally spaced in time. Let's say we can take these measurements and with this, we can construct a sequence of numbers which in this case, sorry, this, we can see that this sequence of numbers actually represent numbers that are not repeating over the sequence. So again, even though we have removed a lot of information from the continuous evolution in time, this sequence of numbers is already enough to tell us that basically the motion of this object now is very irregular because it does not repeat at each iteration. So the question here is, can we build a mathematical model that is able to tell us what's, what's gonna come next in the future. And in terms of numbers, what's the next number in the, sequ in the sequence? Can we find a mathematical model for this? So this brings to the idea of dynamical systems, which is basically mathematical models to understand changes in time. And this can, be taken, this can take two different approaches. The continuous modeling, which is the one that you follow things continuously in time, but this is described in terms of differential equations, which is something that goes beyond the, the scope of this session. So this type of modeling, we will not be considered here today, but instead we'll be looking at this discretization uh, modeling where we basically take, take measurements at some points in time. So this mathematically is described in terms of number sequence that can be described. They are much easier to treat analytically and also to, to try to, to understand a complicated motion by looking at simple sequence of numbers. So the way it works is the following. So we have a starting point, which is represents the present. We have some mathematical rules that represents the model. And with this mathematical rule, we apply it to the first point, which we know it, and then get the next point that represents the future. So if we repeat this over and over, basically we can recreate a sequence of numbers by using this, sim this uh, single mathematical rule, which is the model. So this in mathematics is called iterative map. And basically what the goal is to create a sequence of numbers that represents the time evolution of something. So let's see some examples of this. For example, uh, in general, we will write this mathematical expression where X is the quantity of interest. It could be the angle, or we will see later that it could be the population, a biological population. And X n plus one represent the next point in the sequence. F here represents the mathematical rule, which is the function of the, the model. And X n represents the previous point in the sequence. For example, if the model is simply multiply X by two, this will be represented by a function two X n. And so if X zero, let's say it's one, then the next point in the sequence will be simply X two times one, two. And now we would repeat this procedure starting from x1 to get the next point. So it would be two times two, four. And so you could create a sequence by this simple rule, which is two x. And then you get this sequence one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, and so on. So in this case, the sequence just keeps growing and growing and growing. So let's practice this uh, a little bit. And we would like to ask you now, whether you, are, whether you could tell us what's the mathematical function that describes these two sequences. So first you need to find out what you need to do to each number to obtain the next one. And whether you could write down a mathematical expression that represents this uh, operation. So basically what do you need to do to one to get three? 
and then what do you need to do to three to get five and so on and so on. Any suggestion on what would be the mathematical functions that represent this sequence? Please uh, feel free to type the answers in the chat. If you have any suggestion for the sequence A and sequence B. This might take some time. Yes, that's uh... so in, in the first one, what do you need to do to get from one to three? Yes, indeed. That's... So you can add two to one to get three, and then you can add two to three to get five, and so on. This one is easy to say, but mathematically, how would you express this? So the function f could be written as xn plus two. So at each point, we're just adding two to get the next point. Yeah, seeing some good answers in the chat. What about sequence B? close what do we so if we take two we can multiply two by something well if we multiply two by two it will give us four so it's not quite three but if we take minus one then we'll give us three so four minus one three if you now take three and multiply it by two will give us six and we subtract one will give us five so might see them that two x minus one it's actually what gives and produces this sequence. Does everyone see this? Any comments, any questions on this? Well, this we can see that this, uh, for, with these simple mathematical functions, we can create these sequences, which basically keep growing, keep growing as we keep iterating the, the mathematical function. So the idea here is that we will have basically a mathematical model that describes the evolution of something in time. But we are what we are actually interested on is the long-term evolution of things. So we want to see what happens at sufficiently long time iterations. So to do this, basically we can have two approaches. One is to do and multiply the sequence every time, every iteration by doing it by hand or in a computer. Or we could follow another alternative approach, which is actually quite fun to do. And it's um, a, a graphical approach to understand the long-term behavior of these sequences. And this is something that Alex will uh, talk about it. Yes, so here Mark was talking about a fun graphical way to represent iterative maps. And this is done through cobweb diagrams and staircase plots. And they're a way of looking at what happens to a map without having to compute anything numerically. Um, they get the names due to the, the pattern that you end up seeing once you've done the technique. Um, it can be used to locate the fixed points of a system, and it can also be used to show convergence and divergence of the map. If we go into the next slide, thank you. And so we first identify our function, which we have at the top here. We have xn plus 1 equals 2xn. And I'm going to, in this stage, call it y equals 2xn as the equation. So first of all, how to construct this cobweb plot, we, we draw y equals xn. So that's just a y equals x line. And here we see it in black. And I'm going to call that the baseline. And then the next thing we do is we plot our function line, which here in this case is y equals 2xn. So it's y equals 2x, and we draw that line. Now to start the staircase diagram, 
we, draw, we identify our initial point of x naught, which is one. We find that on the horizontal axis and then draw a, a vertical line upwards to the function line. And this identifies our second point in the sequence too. We then draw a vertical line across to the baseline. And then from this baseline, we draw a, ver a, hor a vertical line upwards to the function line and we get our next point in the sequence, which is four. Repeating this process, we then get the next few points in the sequence. This is repeated, and as you can see from the picture displayed, it shows something similar to a staircase. And this is where it gets its staircase name. This then is a function that tends to infinity. We also have another example, and this is using the function y equals xn over two. And with the initial point of x naught is nine. So again, here we have the baseline of y equals xn and the function line drawn on the graph. We start from nine, draw up to the function line and then across to the baseline, down to the function line and across back to the baseline. And repeating this process, we see that this one actually converges to zero. So we've got another staircase diagram here. We also have now a couple of examples for you to have a go at on Desmos and the link should be in the chat for you. And I think Mark will show you how to get to the next task on Desmos if you're already there. Yeah, so basically if you go, you can just either click here or you can go to next at the top. And here for these uh, activities, we would suggest to use the tool of uh, straight lines. You can just change the, the drawing tool here. And for example, we have this function which is minus one half xn plus seven is the red line. We already drawn the baseline and the function line here. So it's starting, for example, from x one, what you do is to start with a straight line going up to the function line. And then from here, you would go to meet horizontally the baseline and then vertically the function line. So now can you keep iterating this process by following this two basic rules, so horizontally until you meet the baseline, vertically until you meet the function line. And see what happens when you start from x equal to one or x equal to nine. And there are two activities here, this one here and also this one here. So it's, in this case, we are dealing with a quadratic function. And in this case, you might actually see a different picture emerge because in the two examples I showed you, there were two staircase diagrams but you might see now the other name, or at least why it gets this other name. So we are start to see some answers. I think they're looking good. Very good. Actually, they overlay very nicely. So yeah, as you can see from the answers, starting either from x equal to one or x equal to nine, in both occasions, the final point is the same, which is around 4.6. Yeah, 4.6, something like yeah. that. So what happens on the other one? Can you try the quadratic function? Starting from x equal to three or x equal to five. If you move now to the next uh, activity. I think there's a few examples already done as well. And they're looking very good. Yeah, there are some answers already here. So we can see that, yeah, in this case, 
if you start from x equal to three, seems to be going to uh, zero. If you start from x equal to five, it seems to diverge. So in this in this case, where, depending where you start, you might end up in different points in the sequence. Yeah, I think from the answers looks, I think it, it looks, uh, it looks correct. Just yet yeah, to show you the answers here. Um, so you can see starting from uh, this point, it goes around 4.5, starting from the other one. And in fact, here, it doesn't matter where you start from, you will always end up at the same position. And you can see why we call these cobwebs. The other one looks a staircase, and this one is a cobweb. For this case, we have this. If you start at x equal to 5, it goes to infinity. Or starting here, it goes to 0. And in fact, if you start anything less than 4, it will always go to 0. And it, anything larger than 4, it will go to infinity. So this has shown some examples of uh, sequences where things either converge or to diverge. We have seen examples of a linear function, which basically can be generally represented by this function, ax plus b, something like this, for example, the function is linear. And we have also seen an example of a, of a nonlinear map, in, uh, where basically we have powers other than one, could be quadratic or cubic. And we have seen an example of quadratic function. So hopefully this will have given you an idea of how can we quantify and can we study uh, this sequence of numbers. So now let's apply this to a very specific uh, sequence, which is very famous because it leads to a very interesting motion. And that's the logistic map. So this was introduced uh, in the 70s by Robert May, who was a biologist, a mathematician. And he was interested in uh, describing the evolution of an imaginary population of fish with a very simple mathematical model. So the idea was basically is the following. So let's assume that there is a large fish population in a lake, and that means that we are in a closed environment. And we count the number of fishes from year to year. So let's say that in the first year there are four fishes, and then there is nine fishes, and so on and so on. So we're going to do the following. So we're going to assume that there is a maximum population that can fit within the lake, and then define a variable, which is the ratio of the population at the end year divided by the maximum population. So this means that this quantity x, which represents a percentage of the population compared to the maximum capacity of the lake, basically varies between zero, which means that there is no fishes, and one, which it means that this, the lake is at full capacity. So for example, in this case, we have like, like here was 8%, 18%, 30%, 40% in this particular example. So how can, how can we build a model that describes the evolution of this uh, biological population with very simple rules. So what Robert said is uh, basically construct a mathematical model with three basic assumptions, which even though they are very basic, they are actually quite uh, enough to describe a quite generic class of uh, biological populations that live in a closed environment. The assumptions are that basically there is a new fish population created at a given birth rate also, fish population can die at a given death rate. And also, the population can also die because of overcrowding. And this is because we are dealing with a closed system. So if it gets too uh, crowded, then there will be less food available. And so uh, the population will start to die. So mathematically, these three assumptions can be uh, quantified with this mathematical model I'm writing here. And this mathematical model includes two essentially two terms. Let me discuss them briefly. The first one is this linear term Rxn, where R is the difference between the birth rate and the death rate. So now imagine that there's only this term in this equation. So if R is less than one, it means that the death rate is much larger than the birth rate. And so this sequence would be basically decreasing at each iteration because R is less than one. So you're multiplying by something that is less than one every time. So eventually it would go to zero. Or if R was larger than one, it means that the birth rate is larger than the death rate. 
in that case, the population would just keep growing and growing and growing indefinitely because you are multiplying by something larger than one every time. But we have said that we want to include this uh, assumption of overcrowding. And this is taken into account with this second term, which is one minus xn. You can see that when x approaches one, which is the maximum capacity of the lake, this term here actually becomes very, very small because we have one minus something close to one. So it's something basically close to zero. So this means that when x becomes too large, then this becomes very small. And so the sequence is multiplied by something very small. And so it decreases the population. But when x keeps, decre x keeps decreasing and it's less than one, so this becomes less important. And so the population starts growing again. So the competition between these two terms basically is what gives to our, uh, a model that can include these three basic assumptions. And though you can combine this and write it in this form where we have xn minus xn squared. So this is a, an example of these iterative maps that we have described in the previous slides. And it's a linear map and linear term plus a quadratic term. And if you plot the function, you can see that it has this uh, quadratic shape with a maximum at x equal to one half, and then it goes to zero at zero and one. So now we're gonna explore uh, these uh, iterative maps by looking at these cobweb plots. But let me emphasize that uh, some people have argued, and I think I agree with this, that this equation could be one of the most beautiful equations in mathematics, uh, because as we, as we will show you now, it's a very simple equation. It has only a linear and a quadratic term. It retains the most, the simplest, uh, ingredients in order uh, in a mathematical model and yet even though it's so simple we will see now that it can produce incredibly complex uh, and a wide range of different results in particular all of this depends on the parameter r and depending on the value of r it, this equation or this sequence can lead to a fixed points it can go to periodic changes or even chaos as we will explore now as we go through all the cases of R. So let's start with the simplest one, just I'm um, gonna illustrate this by doing by computing the sequence by hand. So let's assume that R is equal to 0 0.5 and the, uh, the initial point is X not 0 0.3. So if you were to do this by hand, you basically would put the 0 0.5 here and then 0 0.3 inside of the brackets minus 0 0.3 squared. This will give you the next point in the sequence, 0 0.105. Then you take this one to get the next one and then you get the next one and so on. So in this case you could say that well after four years the population has decreased and if the maximum population let's say was 10,000 fishes so like for the purpose of, of an example initially there were around 3,000 fishes and then after four years there were around 100 fishes left. So what actually happens when r is less than one is that always the population decreases and it always goes to zero. So basically all the fishes uh, uh, end up dying. So we could plot this in this uh, graph where we have the evolution of the sequence. So on the vertical axis, we have the population. And then on the horizontal, we have the different iterations. So we're starting from 0 0.3, we can see that quickly goes to zero. And also if you start from a different position, again, quickly goes to zero. So that's the crucial point. Whenever R is less than one, the population always decreases to zero independently of the initial value. So let's see what happens when R is larger than one. And for this, we're gonna explore this with the next activity. So if you go to Desmos, you will find the fourth activity. Uh, this graph set up to, do, to draw cobwebs and we would like to ask you to draw cobwebs and maps to see, to identify what's the behavior of the sequence as you keep iterating when you start from 0 0.2 and 0 0.85 and see, and see what happens. Remember that the first point, the first line has to be a vertical line from X down to the function line. 
And then after that, you draw a horizontal line to the baseline and then a vertical line to the function line. So the first one is always a vertical from X until you meet the function line in red. So I think we can see good answers already. I say, I think people have uh, worked this one out. Can see uh, there is some yeah so what basically happens when r in this case for r equal to two is that independently on where you start from you always end up to a fixed point in this case it's around 0 0.5 Yeah, so let's continue. Yes. Well, that's the answer. I'm just going to draw. Solution to this, as you can see, dependently of x, it always ends up to the same point. Yeah, so as you've seen from the activity, these points don't go to zero. Rather, they go somewhere else, especially in this range between one and three. And this is always the case, no matter, no matter the choice of the initial condition. And if you choose R in this range, it will go to its own fixed point. So here you see that they don't all have the same fixed point if you choose R differently. They all have their own separate fixed point or value they tend to. But the big thing is that it's insensitive to initial conditions. And what we mean by this is if we choose R, so in this case on the graph, we've got R is 2.5, and yet we have a very of different colors that show a different initial condition, they all tend to the same fixed point. So no matter where you, where, what initial point you choose, as long as R is the same, they all go to this same fixed point as long as R is between one and three. So let's I think see. we have here another activity. Yeah, let's what do. What happened when R is larger than three. Now we would like to ask you again to plot cobwebs and tell us what's the the behavior of the sequence, what happened in this case. And for this case, you can start from x equal to 0 0.2. Remember that the first always a starting point is a vertical line, in this case from x 0 0.2, all the way until you meet the function red line. So let's see what happens. I think the answers are looking good. Well, like here in this, I mentioned that you need to be a bit precise on where you draw the lines. Yeah, that's my, that might, might be a bit problematic. If you're not very precise in drawing the horizontal and vertical lines, you might get the wrong answer. So I encourage you to, to use the straight line uh, tool and be as precise as you can. Just a reminder that the first line always needs to go to the uh, red line first rather than the, uh, the black line. Yeah, these are some answers, but this might be, uh, I think this uh, might be a problem here. So perhaps we can uh, show, so what's perhaps the, show the what's happened here. So if you do it precisely, so you, you draw the vertical line, then the horizontal, vertical, horizontal, vertical, 
and you will see that at some point you actually end up at the same point as before and you keep repeating this square over and over and over. So this shows that the sequence eventually ends up into a periodic motion, which can be seen more clearly if you plot the sequence versus the number of iterations. And as you can see that we have these two numbers that are repeating. And perhaps now you can recognize this of things what we saw at the very beginning. You re remember the double, the single pendulum. When we try to quantify it in terms of sequence, we saw that the single pendulum could be quantified in terms of this repeated sequence of numbers, which is basically what we observe here in the logistic map when R is larger than three. So what happens actually that uh, these periodic values depend on the value of R. But again, the important point here is that this is insensitive to initial conditions. It doesn't matter where you start from, you will always end up having this periodic motion around two, the same two uh, points. So in fact, what we see is that what happens is that when R is between uh, three and one plus the square root of six, so it's around 3.45, the population always alternates between these two values. So it's periodic motion. So what happens when R keeps increasing? So let's see it's uh, between 345 and 354. What it is observed is that the population alternates between four values. Perhaps if it will be more clear if I highlight the four values, we have these ones here, which are repeated over and over. So what gets more interesting is that if you keep increasing the value of R beyond this point, what happens is that, well, first it was four values, then it becomes every eight values, then every 16 values, and then every 32 values, and so on and so on, until you reach a critical point for R, after, after which the system becomes chaotic. And perhaps you can try and play with the last activity and see where can you go with uh, the cobwebs. This is just a little warning. It can take longer to understand what's going to happen. And actually, if you keep repeating the iteration, you will see that basically the uh, sequence keeps changing and changing and changing. Any responses on this? Uh, you can try. Well, this can take, uh, there are some answers already. Excellent. This can take some uh, time. Yeah, we can leave, uh, well, these activities will be available for you to play later on. So for, for the purposes, uh, for the sake of time, because I think we are running a bit late, we can discuss what happened in this case. I'm gonna show you the animation. And you see when you keep repeating these cobweb plots, basically it just never stops, it never saturates to any value, it never repeats. You could just keep going and going and going, and it will never cross again the same value. So that's what shows this is that. When we go beyond this value of R, then the system becomes chaotic. And actually when you plot this sequence now in this graph, we can recognize these irregular values of the population, which again, we can compare, if you remember the double pendulum, when we try to quantify it early on, we could quantify it in terms of this irregular sequence of numbers. So with the logistic map, we have managed to build a model that is able to produce these highly irregular sequences of numbers. So now the question, well, I say that is chaos, but it is really chaos. So we need to, to test whether it's chaos. We need to see whether this is sensitive to initial conditions. And for this, I'm gonna show you a uh, numerical computation where we reproduce this sequence of numbers starting from two initial conditions, which are basically only 10 to the minus five apart. So one is 0 0.2 and the other one is 0 0.20001. And as you can see that initially, for over the first 20 iterations or so, 
both sequences are exactly the same, but then at some point they start to uh, show different values in the sequence and then eventually they are completely different. And perhaps this also reminds you of this movie that Alex showed at the beginning. We have these 10 double pendulums, initially all of them following the same trajectory, but then eventually deviating from each other and now completely different trajectories. So this shows that the logistic map is indeed can be chaotic because it has this irregular sequence of numbers and also is very can be very unpredictable because by changing slightly your initial condition, it can lead to a completely different behavior. And that's why it's a profound result here because in this case, for example, if you start with either 20,000 fishes or 20,000 plus one fish, this means that eventually after 30 years or so, or so the, the population will be completely different. So these are a remarkable result because it shows that a single fish in the initial condition out of 20,000 can lead down the line to completely different behaviors. So this would be very difficult to predict even if you have the model because any initial disturbance in your condition it, can pro uh, it will prove to be uh, really uh, problematic. So this is what is known as the butterfly effect which is the idea of very small changes in the initial conditions produce widely varying and unpredictable responses. And why is called the butterfly effect? So this is something that uh, Alex will discuss a little bit, the origins of this concept. Okay, so here we have a guy called Edward Lorenz. He was an American meteorologist and mathematician who devised a model for predicting the motion of the atmosphere. Um, and he used something which is now called the Lorenz model. It is a system of differential equations, which we see here. And we'll not go into the details of it because they can be rather lengthy, but we'll show rather a numerical simulation. This simulation is of two particles where one's initial condition is different from the other by 10 to the minus eight. So a very, very small difference. And this system will show you a massive, uh, it will show a massive change in behavior due to this small change in initial conditions. You won't see it just yet because of how small the difference is, but soon you will see the emergence of a different behavior. Here's the emergence of a, a yellow path, which is working alongside the purple path until now where it's completely changed. And you can see one working on one branch of the, say, wing, and then one is on the other side on a different wing. This is a significant difference in dynamics. And this is actually now called the Lorenz Strange Attractor. Lorenz made the point from this that if we use this model to model weather, it's too sensitive to predict anything in the future because one gust of wind could change the trajectory of each of them. This actually showed that long-term weather forecasting is very difficult, if not impossible. And this is where the butterfly effect came in. And his famous quote of, does the flap of a butterfly's wing in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? He's saying one small, tiny little effect, which is, our small, tiny little change in the initial condition caused a massive change in the behavior later. Yeah, that's, that's the main idea of chaotic uh, motion, this highly sensitive dependence on the initial conditions. So we'll just start to uh, wrap up and just to uh, mention that chaos is actually important in many different areas. We have shown some, exa some examples uh, in biology and we, may, we showed early examples of mechanical systems, but you can find examples of chaos in, in fluid mechanics, chemistry, economy, optics, environmental science, and biological systems we have mentioned. So this concept and this topic has received enormous amount of research since it was introduced in the, in the 60s by Ed Lorenz. And here at the bottom, just showing you a couple of examples of research, recent research, where a big question at the moment is, well, we know that chaotic systems can be very unpredictable because we have this sensitive dependence on initial conditions, but can we actually predict them? Can we improve the predictability of chaotic systems? So in a recent work on the left at the bottom, this is an example where it has been used uh, by using statistical methods. We have a, there has been established some condition where predictability of chaos can be improved. And on the right example, I'm showing you some computational simulations of a chaotic system where they use machine learning, which is now a very hot topic, 
an artificial intelligence to try to uh, create a model that can actually learn the emotion of the system as it goes on. So they have shown, and this is quite promising, that by using machine learning, you can improve the predictability of chaos by as much as eight times longer as you would normally have in uh, with the normal chaotic systems. So there is some hope that perhaps in the near future, we'll have machines, well, we have models based on machine learning that might be able to give better predictions of chaotic systems. So just to uh, summarize, the key, mes the key message here is that chaos is deterministic, in principle predictable, but a consequence of this a strong sensitive dependence on initial conditions is essentially very unpredictable. And if you are interested in this, there is some further reading books here at the bottom left. And many of the concepts that we have covered in this session are also uh, discussed and taught in several of our uh, modules at the Open University. So with this, well, thank you very much for uh, attending this session. And uh, we'll be very happy to take any questions that you may have. We've got one question um, from Martin here. Uh, yeah. He would like to ask you, um, they said, am I right in thinking that you could do a similar thing for the R level as the transmission rate in the current epidemic? So I think that relates to your modeling that you were doing. Yeah, so in, um, well, the, the parameter R, they are different because they, we are talking about different models. But in some way, there is some similarity here in the sense that obviously if you change the parameter R in the current epi epi epidemic model, we know that it's important to be less than one or larger than one. And this has a profound effect. So the effect of being less than one or larger than one in the logistic map, it has a similar effect in the sense that in one case, the, uh, if it's less than one, we know that the population decreases. And in the epidemic model, we know that then the number of cases will decrease. But if R is larger than one, then in both cases, things become uh, less trivial. Or in the case of the epidemic, it becomes problematic because then the cases increase. In the logistic model, then for large, R larger than one, uh, things uh, do not go to zero, but then it goes to this uh, interesting different behaviors that depends on the particular value of, of R. But there are some similarities, but fundamentally they are different because we are dealing with different models. But yeah, there are some similarities here. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, thank you, Mark and Alex for a very fascinating session. Um, I certainly enjoyed it and I can see that lots of people are engaging um, through Desmos and through the chat box. So thank you to everybody who joined in and um, watched this session today. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much.